Hello everyone and welcome to Internet Law Review. For today's story, we have the lawsuit that is still ongoing in the matter of Jane Doe versus GirlsDoPorn.com. This is a case on behalf of 22 girls who say that they were tricked by Girls Do Porn and other people in business with them to engage in porn under false pretenses. Namely, that they were signing contracts believing them to be one thing, in particular that the content would not be distributed on the internet, which in fact turned out not to be true. They're suing based on fraud in the inducement, which is the idea that because of this trickery, their consent to the contract was not valid, and therefore the contract is not valid, and are suing for other damages. So we're going to read a little bit about what happened in this case, according to the plaintiffs, and try to make some determinations without the contract language in front of us, because unfortunately that's not available to us at this time, but we'll make some assumptions about the contract language along the way based on how general video releases are written. So with that in mind, let's get started, read the facts, and see what is going on in this case. So we begin here with section four. The previous sections just laid out some information regarding who the defendants are, the nature of the website, how they generally do business, how big they are, trying to show the impact to the girls and so forth and so on. So it's just laying out some generalized factual background that's not really in dispute except for maybe the way it's characterized. But we're going to get to the actual factual issues starting with number four, which talks about the defendant's alleged fraudulent recruiting scheme. The plaintiffs say that defendants' fraudulent recruiting scheme begins with fake advertisements published in gig sections of Craigslist.com, which appeared to be for clothed modeling. The ads are published in larger city and college towns, where there are a high number of 18 to 22-year-old women who need money who are in search for modeling opportunities. The benign advertisements feature pictures of clothed women and contains links to fake meddling websites such as BeginModeling.com and others. Defendants' fake modeling websites feature clothed women and mention nothing about nudity or pornography. The faked modeling website all contains a contact form asking the would-be models to submit their names, height, weight, hometown, age, and importantly, phone number, email address, and pictures. These advertisements and websites allow the defendant to collect addresses and names of women who have never responded to a truthful advertisement revealing what the job was or that it was for internet pornography. Defendants sifted through the submissions of the fake websiting for the youngest and most attractive and grade of women, grades A, B, C, and D, the younger and more attractive, the higher the grade. The plaintiffs continue by saying, having duped the women into releasing their personal contact information, defendants reach out to the victims via email and telephone. If a potential victim asks for text message or email where they intend to distribute the video, they always demand a phone call. On the phone call, defendants tell the victims that they produce adult videos that are distributed in DVD in Australia, New Zealand, or in Europe in small video stores or to private collectors. They repeatedly assure the victims that they will never publish the videos online and the women will remain anonymous after filming. As proof, defendants provide the victims with names and phone numbers of 200 models they've already filmed who will explain that they have filmed for defendants. It went well, they are paid in cash, and their videos have never been published on the internet or discovered by anyone they know. Additionally, the defendants continue to increase the amount of money they are willing to pay the victims to get over any moral holdups. Defendants routinely increased the pre-flight offers until they get the victim to agree. However, defendants rarely prayed the amount promised. Instead, defendants notified the victims just a moment before filming that the victim had some flaw and the producer is disappointed and refused her the amount that she was promised when she would agree. So that might go to a breach of contract as it relates to the promised amounts, but you'd have to see what the actual contract language is in terms of that, in terms of the negotiation of price or otherwise. The plaintiffs continue by saying that unbeknownst to the victims, defendants paid the reference and coaches them on what to say and what not to say. The references fall into two categories, references who they know are lying to when they lie to the victims, and references who just filmed those videos who have not been released yet are under a false belief that what they've been told is indeed the truth. Several plaintiffs are riddled with guilt shortly because after filming the video, but before publishing and releasing their names, they are paid to ask as references and unwillingly help to sell defendants' lies to other victims. The plaintiffs continue by saying that they are going to offer as potential witnesses references who knew that they were lying to the plaintiffs and about the anonymity of filming. The plaintiffs continue by saying that there's another person who will say that a text message in response to a person asking if they are distributing America and saying no, that this person will testify that they said that because that was what they were told to say, that's what they were paying them to say. 
The plaintiffs continue that arguing that while the defendants claim that they've received very few complaints about the videos being posted online, nearly every victim the plaintiffs' counsel encountered, who are well over 100 women, reported to have submitted a complaint of some kind. Apparently, the defendants used several methods to silence victims. If a victim complained about making a post online, the defendants would typically send a letter threatening to sue for breach of contract and defamation if they did not make the post. Many victims complained that they were the only phone numbers they had from recruiting. When this occurred, they would simply block the number. Then the plaintiff goes on to make other allegations about some of the conduct of the defendants, apparently after the contracts were already signed, but in terms of trying to get the witnesses to be silenced or otherwise intimidating them. Um, so that might not go to the issue of the validity of the contracts, but obviously could go to issues like witness intimidation uh, down the line. So when we're looking to the issue of the validity of the contract, we're looking to it at the time it was signed. So this post-contract conduct that they're talking about is not like it's good and not that it's necessarily uh, legal. It might very well be illegal, but it's not going to go to the root issue of the contract's validity. It's going to go to things like witness tampering, witness reliability, uh, defendant's character, and so forth and so on, uh, but not strictly relevant to the issue that we're trying to reach, which is uh, whether or not the contracts themselves were entered into fraudulently. With that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the standard for saying that a contract is invalid for basis of fraud. The consent of a party to a contract must be free, mutual, and communicated to each other. Apparent consent is not real or free when obtained through duress, menace, fraud, undue influence, or mistake. So I'll give you a few of what those means. Um, duress is basically um, the proverbial gun to the head. It's the threat. Um, I'm, I'm, if you don't do X, I'm going to do Y. It's blackmail is kind of duress. Uh, menace would be threats of force um, in other contexts. Fraud is pretty simple. Uh, you're looking to some sort of material misrepresentation. Undue influence, uh, typically you're looking for um, great disparity of ages. You know, you're looking for a minor, um, kind of minor adult relationship. So probably not there here. And mistake is kind of mistake of fact. The parties thought they were negotiating for one thing when they really were not. They're negotiating for something else. So these are generalized contract offenses that you'd be looking to. And this is being held in California, which is going to define the standard for actual fraud. That is the uh, complaint that's alleged here that this was fraud. So reason number three is the reason they're saying it's invalid. And we have a standard for fraud. The standard is that the suggestion as a fact of which is not true by one does not, who does not believe it to be true, positive assertion in a manner not warranted by the information of the person making it, which is not true, even though he believes it to be true, the suppression of that which is true, having knowledge or belief of the fact, a promise made without any intention of performing it or any other act or fit to deceive. So it's written pretty uh, broadly, but it's written in a way to basically say that you're misrepresenting some kind of fact. Actual fraud involves conscious misrepresentation or concealment or non-disclosure of a material fact which induces the innocent party to enter the contract. So when you think about non-disclosure of material fact, the fact that this is porn and that was contemplated by at least the defendants at the time this was made, if that was not represented uh, at some point earlier in the process, um, then that could be an issue of material fact. Now, when that disclosure has to happen is going to be an interest because it's the, you're looking basically to the time the contract is signed as the ultimate question. And what did you know and what didn't you know at the time the contract was signed? So if those representations were made at some point later, that might be sufficient to overcome the fraud, although it might not either because you're induced into certain behavior. Um, so it becomes an issue of fact. It becomes an issue of law that's kind of complicated as to what you knew and when you knew it and exactly what was being said by whom. So these are all questions of fact that have to be teased out at trial. The court goes on to say there are four circumstances in which the non-disclosure or concealment may constitute a fraud when the defendant is in the fiduciary relationship with the plaintiff, which would not be applicable here. When the defendant had exclusive knowledge of material facts not known to the plaintiff, arguably possible. When the defendant actively conceals material fact, arguably possible. And when the defendant makes partial representation but also suppresses some material facts, not clear if that's possible or not. We'd have to know a little bit more about the facts. The plaintiffs go on to point out that indirect fraud is possible if there's a misrepresentation to another who acts in justifiable reliance upon the misrepresentation if it's made by a third person. And here that would be talking about the people that they hired basically to make the misrepresentations for them. Um, I would argue because they were their agents, you could actually say that it's not really a third person for the purposes of this analysis. And you could just say it's direct fraud. But if that argument doesn't work, you can say it doesn't matter if you're their agent or not because you knew they were going to make it and you relied on that and you hoped that they would deceive and they did deceive. So 
if they are their agent, direct fraud, if not indirect fraud. And so they put this in here as sort of a catch, which is uh, always a good legal strategy. When you have a backup strategy, put it in your complaint. The plaintiffs also go on to tell us a little bit about what reasonable reliance on a false representation is, because that's going to be really important because the key word here is a reasonable, reasonable reliance. It has to be reasonable based on the circumstances. And so the, they say that in determining this, the trier of fact, which would typically be a jury, should take into consideration the name of the plaintiff's intelligence, knowledge, education, and experience. Exceptionally gullible or ignorant people have been permitted to recover who took advantage of them in circumstances where a person or well, intelligence would have not been misled. No rogue should enjoy ill gun plunder for the simple reason his valent victim is by chance a fool. So we look to that situation. So we look to put ourselves in the mind of the person of the relevant education, experience, knowledge, and so forth and so on, because we're looking to whether or not they were reasonably relied or reasonably deceived. And so we're basing it based on what they would know and putting ourselves in that shoe. Plaintiffs point out that what would constitute a fraud in a given instance might not be fraud in another instance when exercised to another person. Test of representation is actual effect on a particular mind. And this kind of goes to two ideas in law. First, that law is extremely fact-specific. And second, why lawyers say it depends quite a lot. Because it does depend quite a lot. Because you're looking in this situation to who you're talking to. So the exact same conduct to two different people could be fraud and not fraud dependent on these factors because we're looking to what kind of education, what kind of knowledge, what kind of experience do they have? You know, was it reasonable for them to be deceived or not? There's a bit of a difference when you're talking to someone who's 10 years old who has no knowledge versus someone who's 50 years old who, you know, has multiple PhDs or something. And so that's one of the reasons that law is so dependent on these things because we're trying to make a judgment based on what these people knew and what they, whether or not they were deceived. And then plaintiffs talk a little bit about the parole evidence rule, which I'm just going to talk a little bit about rather than reading what they have here. The parole evidence rule is a rule dealing with interpretation of contracts. And basically what it says is when you're trying to interpret a contract, you start and end with the contract itself. You can't bring in things outside the contract. So if there were terms or promises or representations made that are outside the contract, you can't bring those into the contract for the purposes of saying that this is part of the contract. The contract is the contract, the written document or the final document. Um, and there's usually a clause in the contract that says this explicitly. But basically the idea is that, you know, of course, during negotiations, parties say all kinds of things and they all make all kinds of representations and they change language along, along the way. And, you know, so we look to the final contract. You know, what is it you actually signed? Because everyone can read it for themselves. We don't have to worry about things that were said. But they're saying that here that isn't applicable because the issue isn't the meaning of a contract term where parole evidence would not be permitted. To that, we would just look to the contract itself. Rather, we're just trying to prove if there was fraud. And obviously, the contract itself can't tell us that. The contract itself has no information to offer in whether or not the contract was entered into on fraudulent terms. So parole evidence is not relevant for the purposes of determining fraud. It would be irrelevant for determining the meaning of a contract term, but it's irrelevant for determining whether or not a party was tricked, deceived, or otherwise did not have the requisite mental intent for entering into a contract. So basically, that's the entire case here, whether or not there's fraud or not. There's obviously some other framing stuff, calls for relief, but in terms of the legal issue we're trying to get to, the fraud, we that's all we really need to know for this case. Um, so we have some evidence that suggests fraud. Now, there's a lot of things we don't know. First of all, we don't have a copy of the contract. Um, it does not appear to be on the court docket, and that's fine because this is still at trial, and it does not appear to have been offered at evidence yet. So we would obviously have to go to the contract. But I'm going to go ahead and be bold and make a couple of assumptions about what it says, says based on generalized releases of you know documents of these type. And I'm going to assume that it's very broadly written, like most releases are. Basically says that, you know, Party A gives Party B the right to use the footage for any and all purposes, any all mediums, any all countries, limited, unlimited, time unlimited. You know, basically you can use it for any purpose, any reason, full waiver, full, full grant, full assignment of copyright, blah, blah, blah. You know, these things are written extremely, extremely broad to give the maximum consent and maximum uh, flexibility both now and in the future. So I'm going to assume without reading it, because I don't have it to read, that this is written in a way and it says basically uh, you can do anything you want with this footage at any time, in any way, in any medium. You can assign those rights to anyone else. You can... Uh, you can do anything you want with this. This is, this is fully your content in exchange for which I want some sort of monetary reward. So if the contract does indeed have that kind of language in it, as I would suspect it does, 
the parole evidence rule actually does become useful because if the representation they're making is we were tricked into this because we didn't think it would be used in the United States, and then you go read the language and it says, well, we can use it absolutely anywhere, you know, that representation was maybe a negotiating provision, or so it would be argued, and it's not in the final contract. So that would tend to show parole evidence rather than fraud in the inducement, although that, of course, still would have to be teased out trial as an issue of fact you know, as to what the jury thinks. The other big question that is not clarified here is whether or not this contract, this waiver, had a provision for arbitration in it. And I would be surprised if it didn't. They almost always do. Now, this case has been going on three years. And as far as I can tell, um, from a quick look at the docket, I didn't read it exhaustively because there's you know, like 150 things in the docket. There didn't appear to be a issue with arbitration. This seems to be going on um, to um, at, at trial. So you know, it, it appears that there's no arbitration provision. That seems a little odd to me. Um, because I would imagine that they do, because they almost always do, um, and then this would be heard by an arbitrator, because you know whether or not there was fraud on the contract or vice versa would be an issue for an arbitrator, trial of fact. But you know this was filed three years ago, as just now going to trial after all the discovery motions and all the preliminary motions. Um, the defendants made an attempt to uh, say these, John D these Jane Doe's names should not be kept secret. Um, those have been lost so far. I think those are still on appeal right now. So this is still pending, determining whether or not the, the names of these people are going to have to be known or not. Um, I assume at some point they have to be known just as a purely practical reason because, you know, what these people were told is going to be information that only they can say. You know, we're going to whether or not they were fraudulently induced, and it goes to their state of mind, what they knew, and really no one else except them can testify to that. You know, someone else can testify as to what I told them, but whether or not they were tricked by that or fraudulently induced or otherwise, you know, only you can say. You know, just because I told you a lie doesn't mean that you believe the lie or were tricked by the lie or were induced by the lie. You know, it might have been something you detect. So, you know, this evidence from these other people saying, well, we were engaged in a scheme to trick doesn't necessarily mean that it, the scheme succeeded, that they were in fact tricked. To get that evidence, you'd have to get these people on the stand or otherwise get evidence from them because only they are in the position to, to, to say, yes, I was tricked, this is what I was told, and this is how I thought about it, this is my understanding, these were my representations. So I don't see off the top of my head how you get around these people being on the stand. And if they're on the stand, you're going to have to call them by name. You know, like question number one is like, what is your name? And uh, so I don't know how you um, keep this information suppressed. Um, I would imagine they're going to have to testify. I don't really see an alternative um, because only they can testify to critical elements of this um, this evidence. So um, we'll see what goes on. But so far, uh, they're anonymous, but I don't know how long that will hold. But we will see if there's any other filings in this proceedings. It may be a while because it's been three years so far. So who knows how long it will take to get something new. But for now, my friends, I hope this was helpful. Until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.